Hello, very good morning to you. You're welcome along to Wednesday's Off the Ball. It's the day of the Europa League final. What a disappointment it is, really, that Arsenal aren't in it, because then we'd have an excuse to spend 25 minutes previewing it. Well, we can still spend 25 minutes previewing it if you want, like Marseille, a club base in France, against Atletico, a club base in Spain. I can tell you a little bit more about Atletico than I can about Marseille, but uh, I am confident they are based in France. Well done. And their home ground is the Sad Velodrome, and uh, I'm going to start to think of another. Frank Reber used to play for them. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Tony Cascarino, of course. I'm sure I've got enough facts to last these next 25 Papa. minutes. Yeah, well, exactly. So there's a lot of history in this. Let's say it's the the old aristocrats of Europe coming up against the new semi aristocrats of Europe. I, I mean, in kind of like a Europa League level. Yeah, and a second tier level. The old is in the 80s. Aristocrats. Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. Like that is a long time ago, Jer. <laughs> No, it's not. It's also not that old. Uh, loads of interesting stuff going on that we're going to talk about on the show today. Um, the TV rights for the Champions League have gone almost exclusively to TV3. They have exclusive rights to the final um, for a three-year period. They have exclusive rights to the Europa League final, to the Super Cup, uh, to all the qualifiers. Um, although all the English teams are actually going to be already through, so it'll be the Irish teams mainly in, in terms of those qualifiers that... Um, we end up watching on TV3. They've also got a double header on Wednesdays. So everybody hasn't kind of quite woken up to the fact that there's going to be two kickoff times, a 5.55 kickoff time and an 8 o'clock kickoff time, which means that there's going to be a lot of live football on TV, free to air. It's a lot of football. You will have three days a week in October, November time where you're just spending half your day watching football, which is going to be Sunday, Tuesday and Wednesday. It's going to be like Super Sunday. It's going to be Super Tuesday and Super Wednesday, where you just sit down all day. And Thursday, uh, Europa League. And well, people don't really watch Europa League unless there's an English team involved. Maybe at the start, if, they, if there's a good like, there was a lot of interesting neutral ties this season. Irish people might be, be watching Burnley next season. Fair, good points. Our uh, entire team playing for them. You've got you've got Burnley in there. You've got Arsenal in there. So there, there's certainly two teams that Arsenal are in, or that our Irish fans are interested in. Uh, and also as well, you look at the, the quality of teams that were in the Europa League this year. There was a lot of very interesting neutral ties in there with the likes of uh, Leipzig and Atletico and the likes of Marseille and Salzburg and all that sort of stuff. So for sure, it could be four days. But I think Tuesday and Wednesday nights are suddenly going to become a thing where you get home at half five and you sit down in front of the TV and you get back up at half past ten. Yeah. You're like, whoa, where did those five hours go? Just like, happen just like it happens on a Sunday afternoon uh, in the company of Sky Sports. But except this would be everybody in Ireland because it's free to air, which is fantastic. Well, the Irish Times are speculating about that and they're not sure if everything's going to be free to air. If, if somehow Virgin are going to come up with a way to charge people for this. But I, I don't know if that's going to be the case. I think that sport has been a big success for them. And the ability to sell advertising around those matches is going to be huge. You can lock advertisers in for a 12-month deal and it seems to make a lot of sense to them. So we'll see. Um, the other thing is that no one has confirmed what kickoff time RT have. They, RT have said they have first choice on a Tuesday. Do they have first choice in the 5.55 kickoffs? Or do they have first choice for what kickoff time they have? There's a bit of, uh, a bit of uncertainty about that and TV3 still, Virgin Media slash TV3 haven't yet confirmed what they're going to do. So uh, if you've got an opinion about that, about the broadcasting and what this actually means for uh, sports broadcasting, I wouldn't be terribly surprised if Virgin launched a pay sports TV channel and put loads of these games behind the paywall. Um, a rival to Air Sport, for example. Yeah, for sure. Like uh, You could see that happening because on the Virgin package as well now, you don't have BT Sport, you don't have Air Sport. So they could double down on that and it's like, wait a minute, customers, come over to Verge and we'll give you our sports package for free. You're not going to be able to get the Europa League anymore if you have to use another provider to watch BT or Air Sport. So why don't you come over to us and you'll get all this stuff free once you sign up to Virgin? Or don't leave us. It's like uh, most of this money that's being spent is apparently about customer retention as opposed to actually getting new customers because it's people are very lazy. They go and they sign up and they renew and the banks look after it and it's like, oh, that money goes out of my account, my TV. I don't need to... No one needs to come to my house. No one needs to change my system. Like, I don't need to learn how to use a new remote control, because let's face it, nobody can. Yeah, well, uh, hopefully Virgin Media come up with a new remote control. Uh, like, um, it, it's, a, it's, it's a current a, one, crappy. It, well, it's a, it's a clunky one, but uh, other than that, it's a pretty good service. Uh, as, a, as a paying customer of Virgin Media, I don't know why I'm starting to talk about my <laughs> broadband and television paying habits, but... Uh, you want it free from somebody else, you, you, what you're saying. Yeah, you mentioned the remote control, and I was like, if I can make one improvement... Uh, on my list of to-do by Virgin Media, it's well, get a better remote. Well, I, I mean, if, so if we put you in charge of their football coverage, how would you improve it? 
What? Like, I mean, in terms of TV3's yeah. football coverage, I think TV3 are doing a very, very good job, no? I mean, like, it's hard for us to be critical given that all our mates work for them, but... Uh, well, there is that, but I mean... In I, fairness, they've got Sunas, and Sunas is great. Sunas apparently walked off Sky at the Sky, weekend. Yeah, did because he actually he was, did literally walk off? Uh, no, in an ad break, and right. then suddenly Graham Sunas became Gary Neville. And uh, I don't think many people batted an eyelid because it was after the game, I think, and people were just thinking to themselves, right, this is the part where Gary Neville does his thing, they don't really need Graham. And Graham's gone back down to somewhere else. Wherever, yeah. But just on the TV3 point, because they're going to have such a long show now on uh, a Wednesday night especially, they'll have it on a Tuesday as well, they just won't have first choice on whatever slot they have. They've, they've always managed to do that change of pace very, very well. Are they going to have Kerr. double headers on Wednesday and Thursday? And, sorry, Tuesday, and, and, Tuesday. and Tuesday. So is it will be a double header. So they'll have second well. choice on whatever slot it is. That we, and we don't, first choice in the other slot. And first choice in the other slot. But it's Champions League. Second slot, second choice is a bloody good game. So yeah, they're, they're going to have good football wall to wall. But just, just as I was saying there. Liverpool, d- Celtic. Well, Liverpool never be second choice, but it could be Celtic, it could be Real Madrid, it could be. Yeah. Um, like, I mean, when you get past the live games that they used to have on a Tuesday, then they go into their highlights show, and it's boom, it's Brian Kerr in the building with his like really good takes on football, really good analysis on whatever game we haven't been watching. So they're able to do that. They're able to change the pace midway through a lengthy program. So they're going to have no problem doing five hours of wall-to-wall football coverage. I look forward to it, actually, because they've innovated quite well. I think a lot of people are on side of TV3 Sport uh, after the Six Nations. They did a very good job of that. The, the, the kind of perception has changed, certainly, from the World Cup in 2015 to now, when people are like, right, they can do rugby very, very well. They've always done Champions League very well. Well, not always. At the very start, when Packy Bonner was presented. I can barely remember that. But anyway, let, like into the next couple of years, you can imagine things will get better and better. If they go behind the paywall, it'll probably improve further, realistically. I mean, you look at what Sky Sports have done with their paying customers' money, they've innovated very, very well. Um, and like maybe, maybe Sky Sports are a loss-making organisation, I don't know, but you'd imagine, given the no, amount Sky of... Sky Sports makes lots of money. Do they, yeah? Sky News is loss-making. Well, given the amount they shell out, you're always going to be close enough to the line. And what they do with the money that they're taking in from subscriptions, they do very, very well with. And BT, I guess, are lagging behind a small bit, but they're not too far. They've, they haven't been afraid to innovate. So you can see what happens when you go behind a paywall and things improve to no end. But uh, yeah, it's going to be very, very interesting. It happens right away from this September. Yeah, so and they're going to, or TV3 are obviously going to reveal more details uh, in the near future about what exactly their plans are. I think speculation that they'll charge for the Champions League final is off the mark because there wouldn't be absolutely no point in doing that. The amount of money that you can make in advertising of the Champions League final is absolutely massive. And so there would be no point in um, getting those rights and then putting them behind a paywall. Ultimately, those games are going to be streamed live. BT are streaming the Champions League final live on YouTube anyway. So it's kind of quite easy to find a lot of games on YouTube. I remember one of the Leinster rugby matches, I was um, in my parents' house and they didn't have whatever channel it was on, and then a quick, a quick search on Reddit for a stream, and it was like, it's actually on YouTube. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that is quite funny when you do, uh, if, if you are stuck... How can I get this stream illegally? Oh, look, it's on YouTube. Yeah. You, but, you, but broadcast by one of the actual broadcasters. Yeah, for sure. Um, like, it doesn't make sense to put the Champions League final behind a paywall, but it doesn't make sense to put any of the other games behind a paywall when you think about the advertising revenue anyway, because... Like, if, if, if you're offering, if you're building a new sports TV channel, it does. Sure. Like, you'd have to have a whole kind of programming around it's Something it. else. Yeah, so basically, if you're setting up a rival to air sport, then it does, but otherwise, it doesn't. But I, I think Champions League is on the level... Maybe just a, a level below, say, X Factor at its peak. It is a television event of the night, every except, single night it's except on. Except you used to have you used to have a free to air on ITV for most people. That isn't going to be the case. There will be no games available to anybody. So if you put it behind a paywall, then you have to pay for it somewhere, and you may as well pay an Irish company, Maria, as opposed to um, BT. But anyway, uh, speaking of Graham Sunis, who left early, um, a statement has come out from Nigel Dunn. A lot of speculation about the awfully football situation. I did not leave O'More Park at halftime on Sunday and head for my car. Sure I came in the team bus? A good point. I left the dressing room to get some air, have a sulk and feel sorry for myself. Nothing more. I was back on the subs bench as the ref threw up the ball for the start of the second half. Uh, fair play to Nigel Dunn, admitting that uh, he had a bit of a sulk. We all have a bit of a sulk from time to time. Yeah, we, we do. I mean, it- And he came back. Is is halftime of a championship game the time to have a sulk? Probably not, but at least he's admitted it. Well, it seems like what's going on in Offaly football is an absolute farrago. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later on in the show as well. I want to bring you this first. You can talk about this. It's Marcelo. It's little, <laughs> little, little baby Marcelo. Well, you've, you've pretty much teed it all up there, yeah. So, Marcelo's obviously going to the World Cup, but I think he should probably bring his kid with him. He'd probably do a job somewhere for any team, really. Um, here he is. 
going all the way around the dressing room. Keep an eye out for Modric. Yeah. Modric enjoys this the most, and his dad hasn't even put Keep him. Keep an off eye out for Keller Navas here. He's in, in the corner. Hey, John's Navas, goalkeeper. Ah, uh, you skipped him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Navas doesn't even get up and celebrate until like it's too late. So Keller Navas hates Marcelo's kid, basically. <laughs> I mean, it was uh, it was pretty wise though, because it would have been far too hard to get that angle back. Marcelo's kid knew that Keller Navas is a goalkeeper, and he can't head the ball. He was like, "I'm going straight to Ronaldo. I'm so close here." Screw you, Keller Navas. And uh, yeah, so I'm looking forward to seeing how that soap opera develops, the, the war between the, the Navas and uh, Marcelos. Coming up on the show a little bit later on, uh, a busy GAA day for you. We are going to be talking uh, the Munster Hurling Championship this weekend. Uh, two brilliant games, obviously. Tip and Limerick and Clare and Cork. Bit of a debate in the office yesterday about which game was actually the game of the weekend. I think it's going to be the Tip Limerick game. I'm predicting that the Cork Clare game is going to be a bit too one sided. I think Cork going to win that. Really? Yeah. I think that Limerick going to. Did you watch the league game between them this year? I think that Limerick going to put it up to tip. I think. D- remind everybody about what happened in the league game. So Clare destroyed Cork in the first half. I think Cork came, it went into the dressing rooms at halftime with four points under their belt. It was like fifteen points to four or something. Now Cork came back very well in the second half and lost by only four points. Uh, but Clare killed them. The scoreline did not represent that. But maybe that's the failing of Clare. Maybe Clare aren't going to be clinical enough to actually beat Cork at the weekend. I think it's going to be a very tight game. I think they're both cracking games. I'm not trying to downplay Limerick versus Tip because you've got one of the, a, a, a coterie of the greatest young players in Munster currently going up against the All-Ireland favourites. Yeah. So it's a, like they're both brilliant games. Uh, so Patrick Donald's going to join us a little bit later on. Also going to talk football with John Bruin. Uh, we will, of course, mention the fact that the Europa League final is on tonight, but loads of other stuff going on as well. Patrick Vieira very pissed off about the fact that he only got a pretend interview, didn't even get an interview for the Arsenal job, that it looks like it's sewn up for Mikel Arteta. Eden Hazard is in the papers whining about the quality of footballer who is currently at Chelsea, which I'm sure is endearing him to his teammates. Uh, we'll talk about that. And then also we're going to talk about the uh, marathon. Were you tempted to declare that that's it? I've got the body shape, I've got the age, I've got the time in my hands... I've got nothing better to do than prepare for a Halloween marathon in Dublin. Well, that's actually the first question in the interview later on with Katrina Jennings and Lizzie Lee. I'm not going to spoil it just yet, but if, you, if, never, if you've never run a marathon, I'm asking on behalf of you and I, is it possible to run this year's marathon? Answers to come later on. It's only the 16th of May. What? Of course you can run it. I don't want to spoil things, but uh, yes, I, I, I got a look from the two of them that was like, <laughs> you're an absolute idiot. What the hell are you even asking this question for? You don't stand a hope. Okay, well, so they were goading you into it. You're going to do it. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. Yeah, of course I will, yeah. Are you going to do it? No, I'm not going to do it. Go on, do it. I, I, I can just... I, I can't see myself... You can myself. only live vicariously through Owen deciding that right now, this moment, he's been seized by the moment, <laughs> inspired by two of our greatest uh, women marathon runners this decade. Well, I wasn't inspired by them. They told me, no, you're not going to be able to do it. <clears throat> exactly. So, you're going to prove them wrong. Okay, yes, I'll, I will prove two of our greatest marathon runners wrong because I know better than them. Uh, I mean, you know, everybody needs a little chip on their shoulder. So Owen's going to run the marathon. That's what we've decided. Uh, right, time for the sports pages. OTB AM. In association with AIR. Get AIR sport free with AIR broadband. All right, so we are going to start... With whatever comes up first here, I suspect it's going to be the Irish Independent. Is it? No, we don't have the end of PDF. There you go. So it is going to be the Irish Independent because that's what I'm picking up. Hazard warning for Blues. This is it. Eden Hazard. No, screw you, Chelsea. I won't sign a new contract. I'm not going to do anything until I find out exactly who it is that you are signing to play with me because I'm one of the best footballers in the world. And frankly, look at the shit that I have to deal with. That's about it. Yeah, he, he is their best player. The signings that they've made haven't been particularly good. But on the outset, when you look at some of the signings they made, you're like, that's a good signing. Alvaro Morata, good signing. Tiamue Bakayoko, good signing. Yeah, maybe they get better next season. There's like Maybe that whole coming to play for Chelsea affects some people. And also, it was clearly the season that Chelsea were going to have off. Um, Munster sent back a 1,000 tickets for the RDS semi-final showdown. This is interesting. I think this game is all set up for a Munster smash and grab. Munster, very pissed off, sat at home watching Leinster win a fourth, which is two times as many European Cups as, 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 Munster, as Munster have. Uh, also have had a week off. Also, as you were saying off air, Leinster are not really used to going back to back to back the way they have this week. Also, celebrations. Like, Easton Sea was asked, oh, what, what, you know, what difference does it make? You have Munster next weekend in terms of celebrations. None. You have to celebrate these moments. It's the fourth time ever in the club's history that they've won this competition. 
it looked three seasons ago like they were never going to get back there again. All of a sudden, they're the greatest team in Europe by a mile. And so, uh, I just think that Munster, eight point, nine point underdogs generally across the board. This is all the PR narrative. Having from a bit Lens of that. Eason and Say was like definitely towing the party line here, where it's like we're going to hammer Munster on Saturday, and we're going to tell everybody we've been partying all week. That's how embarrassing it's going to be for Munster. Secretly, you know, people think that they're in coppers, but in actual fact, they're doing late night sessions back in Donnybrook. They didn't even celebrate last weekend. I bet you they just told people they did, and they're going to hammer Munster on Saturday and come out and say, "Oh well, we celebrated all week and we still beat them." So social media these days, uh, I'm sure that lots of people saw many Leinster people out, many of the Leinster players out, and fair play to them. They should be celebrating it, right? Absolutely. Uh, but I do think that there's a very good chance that Munster are actually going to uh, beat them or get very, very close to beating them this weekend. Uh, United and Liverpool in the 100 million cup. This is the new replacement for the Club World Cup. Um, going to be held every four years. First one's going to take place in June 2021. China is understood to have already expressed an interest in paying for the right to it. Um, no, sorry, in being the first host nation, it didn't actually say paying for the rights to hold it. Ireland going back to Chicago. You were in Chicago. Oh, no, sorry, you weren't. That was there last month. This month. That doesn't, so it, yeah. it does count. It definitely counts. <laughs> um, and then England are going to play one-day international uh, in Malahide in cricket and uh, never going to play test cricket against us, apparently, or at least not for years and years and years and years. And maybe by 2022, they might come over and play uh, a one-day international. If they, don't, if they can't fit us into their busy schedule next year, screw you, England, stealing our best players for uh, generations and generations, and we finally become a test nation, and you're like, oh, yeah, 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 good, oh, well done, lads, off you go. No, we won't play you. No, we definitely won't play you. We won't waste one window of five days to play you because screw you. They don't want to give up another century to Kevin O'Brien. That's what. That's what. That's what I'm seeing here. It's fear from the English. Uh, here's this great story, which um, I wonder should we play the Brian Gavin stuff now, given that it's uh, on the cover here. So it's faithful Ferrari, Offaly Chiefs launch review of Wallace tenure after Wicklow loss. There is, uh, you know, <clears throat> I don't know the etymology of the faithful county. Nickname, but it doesn't look like they're going to be very faithful for very long to this management. Uh, I'm just going to read you the headline from this, and then we'll play you some of Brian Gavin from last night on the radio. Offaly GA Chiefs have commenced a review of their senior football management following Sunday's Leinster Senior Football Championship defeat to Wicklow. Normally, you would wait for the review for the championship season to be over, but we're in the middle of it now. Literally, we could be in the middle of it. Two games, first game beaten, second game potentially beaten, depending on the relations, uh, or depending on the uh, result. Relations between manager Stephen Wallace, coach Billy Sheehan, and the squad are understood to have reached crisis point, with the board looking into events surrounding the five-point defeat after extra time to Wicklow, including claims of a half-time dressing room row. Uh, Brian Gavin was on the radio last night. Obviously, Brian Gavin, uh, a famous referee, inter-county hurling referee. Tommy Walsh accidentally nicked him in the head in that... Um, uh, Kilkenny tip game they made peace afterwards so it was all grand uh, here he is um, he's also an analyst now at Midlands Radio talking about the Offaly situation there was rumours there's not rumours it's a fact that six or seven of the players said they will not go back if Stephen Wallace uh, continues on as manager of the Offaly and we just can't we've only 26 or 7 training as it is so we couldn't lose another 6 or 7 that's for certain uh, under under the management and I think they have let the county chairman know Tommy Bourne so and are these um, potential starters? oh I'd say maybe 3 or 4 Joe definitely potential starters obviously you know we won't mention names and that wouldn't be fair to the chaps involved sure. but um, definitely so there was a rumour that there was going to be training tomorrow night I can't see that happening and waiting to see who turn up nearly which is you'd nearly think that was a junior B situation you know mm-hmm. who will turn up and what will happen so it's unfortunate for Stephen Wallace and his backroom team. I, like, in fairness, I interviewed him a few times. Uh, I found him grand. Um, I couldn't have any complaints, but as I said, I think the straw that broke the camel's back was the incident in the Kerry Club game. It just left a very, very sour taste. And the players then, I'd say, were disgusted with what they saw, and it hasn't got any better, plus the Johnny Maloney incident. So yeah. I just can't see that he's lost the complete dressing room at the moment, and I just can't see a way back. And unfortunately also, Joe, that former players who really put work into Offaly for down through the years, Alan McNamee, Rory Allen, you know, they have said tweets, mm. which is on social media, and they've got likes from some of the current players, so it's a real it's, mess, to be honest with you, Joe. And I just honest, hope yeah. that we could get over this and maybe appoint someone for the qualifiers and start looking to Division 3 next year to try and build momentum. Rose Alan McNamee, who played 100 times for Offaly, is the, um, was mentioned there. 
It was an awful pity to see one of the best footballers in the county, Johnny Maloney, on the terraces today, and our manager, in inverted commas, the man who had him there, hiding under a hat and a hoodie in the stands, liked by several members of the Offaly panel. <laughs> Former player tweets out about current manager. But it's not as if like, he's, like, 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 voluntarily gone up and... Like, he's not hiding from the situation. Clearly, he's banned. He's not allowed to, uh, to be on the sideline. He's banned for his part in a sideline brawl during a club well, game. Hold on a minute. Why is he saying that he's hiding? Well, because he's dressed in... Uh, you can't really see that picture there because it's too small, but he's dressed in... Uh, pulled up a beanie hat and a hoodie and pulled up and, and kind hold, of Hold on a minute. I, like, I, I'm not going to... Like, you, you're about to allude to what happened between Ardford and John Mitchells in the Kerry Intermediate Football Championship, which is completely unacceptable and he's completely deserving of his ban. But what would you do if you were banned from managing your county? Just sit there at the top and say, hey, look at me, everybody come over and disturb me while I'm watching my county play. Of course he's going to try and communicate. He's wearing a wire, for God's sake. He, he he actually, he, like, I don't think you're allowed to communicate. Well, I, I don't know. What, like, he definitely has some sort of earphone in. Does he? I don't know if he's allowed to communicate or not, but you're going to try your best to get some sort of message down to the team. You can like, have a runner, but I think you hiding. Can... Like, I mean, what? I think that's just... I think that's a strange comment to make. I, I mean, don't think it's that strange. I mean, it's not like... <clears throat> it's not like he sat in the press box, which he could have done. Could <clears throat> he? Pardon me. Yeah, why not? I, I don't know. I wasn't there. Was the press box full? There, it was a championship game. There's the picture game. there. There's the picture there. Uh, I mean, it's not that full. It's, um, it's obviously... These stadiums aren't going to be full for these games. But uh, I guess you're not out front and centre. You're kind yeah, of you're uh, pretty low key. Hold on, like Tommy's just saying to my ear there that is he talking into a mic? <coughs> I'm pretty sure there's another image where there you is, yeah, yeah, see front, a wire. You can see a wire in the front of that. So I mean, are you allowed to? I, I don't know what the rule is. My point here is just diminishes the whole point of a suspension if you're just allowed to call down to the lads, isn't it? Well, like what? What about Davy and his box there last year? But did Davy was Davy on the microphone in his box? I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure he had some sort of line of communication. I don't, I don't know. Like, I'm not sure, is it a sideline ban only, or is it a ban from all GA uh, matches? I'm not quite sure on that one, but the, the point here is that he did deserve his ban. He hasn't proven himself to be kind of the, the shining light that a lot of people in Offaly might, might have thought he was. He certainly didn't help himself with the incident uh, in the club game in Kerry. His reputation, unfortunately, is going to be diminished hugely as a result of this. Um, and I, I do fear that we haven't got the real representation of the, the quality of Stephen Wallace's managerial capabilities. So it's unfortunate this is, it's going to end like this for him, you would suspect, on an inter-county level. They had OK results in the league, really. I mean, they lost Armagh and Derry and Fermanagh. I, I do find it curious that the, that the county board is now launching a mid-season uh, review, given that they've robbed him of his best young player. They were the ones who made the decision that Keane Johnson wasn't going to play for the Offaly Seniors yeah, this maybe, year. <coughs> Keane Johnson wasn't happy with that. But I'm maybe, not sure how Stephen Wallace felt about maybe, that. Maybe they didn't think that he was the right man to be managing uh, this superstar's career. That's like, a pretty bad indictment. Why didn't they launch the review after the league then? Why did they leave it until the week beforehand to, to say to Keane Johnson, you're not going to play? If they really felt that Stephen Wallace wasn't the guy to manage Offaly, then he made that decision at the end of the league. Uh, well, who knows? Why, why, why are you giving the, him subliminal messages, <laughs> taking stealing his best young player? It's not that subliminal. It's also... It's also a decision that they decided that they were going to have this rule and that they weren't going to risk young players. Fair enough, he wants to play, right? And I think that probably generally in those circumstances, you let the player decide. And obviously he'd been grand during the league and the O'Byrne Cup. Been very good. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I suspect the other point is that whoever appointed him is responsible for appointing him. And if it is as ridiculous a situation as it seems, they need to take responsibility for it. And so Without therefore, it's, it's Turkey's voting for Christmas. Uh, yeah, did that one. So the Rossing Post is, uh, let's hear it for Harry. The big day arrives as Prince of Sprinters returns and bid to tie rivals and knots. Day one of York's Dante meeting is uh, today. So that's what that is about. And Kings of Leon, Atletico set for crowning glory in Europa League final. Yeah, they're definitely going to win that, aren't they? Uh, you, you would think so, yeah. They are, they are one of the best teams in Europe. They shouldn't be in that competition. Uh, on the back page of the Herald, uh, Salah says, I had a point to prove. Uh, Liverpool leading the way on the back of this newspaper. Mo aiming to silence critics in Euro showdown with Madrid. You've also got an electricity league result there saying Pats 2, Sligo Rovers nil. And this one here, it's uh, Corcoran, we will move on. So that's the Ireland under-17 keeper Jimmy Corcoran saying that uh, the past is the past. He took to Twitter last night to say, now it's a time to accept that. Although as cruel a blow as it was, the decision was correct and we will move on and learn from it to become stronger. It goes without saying again, uh, Jimmy Corcoran and his uh, Ireland teammates at the under-17 level have the maturity of somebody well beyond their years and for him to accept that is incredible. Sports star of the week. Sports star of the week, without question. Uh, on the back of the mirror this morning, it's we're Real good too.
Van Dijk tells Reds to believe they can down Madrid stars. Uh, a lot of build up there actually to the Champions League final, even though there's 10 days to go. Hazard says, I'll wait on the new Blues. That's Eden Hazard's story again, talking about how Chelsea needs to sign better this summer if he's going to renew his contract at the club. Uh, Red was right. That's the Jimmy Corcoran story. And Faithful starts off. That's uh, Pat Nolan's story there, saying that at least four players have left the Offaly panel. On the back of the start this morning, they're leading with that Patrick Vieira story that Jerry mentioned a few moments ago. Your token the Mick, Vieira Fury, at Arsenal job gesture. Grealish backs veteran Terry as well. Aston Villa have progressed through to the Championship playoffs final. That's going to be a cracker. It's on in 10 days as well. I think it's a 5 o'clock kickoff before the Champions League final. They're taking on Fulham uh, in the richest match in football. Uh, FAI hope O'Neill's in the clear. Of course, Martin O'Neill could get a ban for his role and his alter not an altercation. Uh, his uh, communication with the referee after the under-17s lost the other night, it was harmless. If Martin O'Neill gets a ban for that, it is an absolute disgrace. He's definitely going to miss one of those, what is the competition called? Nations Cup? Nations League. Nations League. It's I one, mean, like, you've, you've got to give that competition the respect it deserves. It'd, and be a tragedy it's the first if, step. it'd be a tragedy if Roy Keane had to stand on the sideline on his own. But no, like... Yeah, but I think it's kind of the message it sends. It's like... I was delighted, Martin O'Neill. Get out there. Go on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, on the back of the sun, it's Aiden quit threat, break the bank or I'm off, has our Blues warning. Yes, they will. That's Aston Villa nil, Middlesbrough nil, which is good enough to send Villa through to the playoffs final. Hart Axe Fury aimed at Moyes, so uh, we've got Joe Hart blaming David Moyes for his role in not getting involved in the England squad this year. He was going to be number three, and Socket says, you're actually going to be my number four. That so is, that is uh, Hart's career in a nutshell, blaming somebody else for his own propensity to be crap. And then David Moyes naturally blames somebody else. So I'm looking to see how far these dominoes fall in terms of the Joe Hart not making the squad. Is it our fault? I mean, hopefully. It pro it probably, it's probably my fault. On the back of the Guardian, it's England shock. Southgate's generation game cuts Hart and Wilshire. Wilshire, the other high-profile player likely to miss out. Fabian Delph looks like he's going to make the squad. Danny Rose and Ashley Young also likely to make it as well. So, small surprise there, but I think Fabian Delph is a great inclusion. I don't think it's a shock either. No. Um, we'll uh, talk with John Bruin about that in just two seconds. Um, Kevin Caban was obviously on the show last night talking about what made Jack Wilshire so good early in his career. When he first came through, when he was 16, I played against him uh, when he was 16, 17, and I'm think, seeing this young player thinking, this, this boy could be anything he wants to be. Um, he, now he was, you, you spoke about earlier on, um, in relation, who was, the, who was the lad you were saying before in relation to Gaza? Uh, Jack Grealish. Was it Grealish you mentioned? Yeah, Steve Bruce, Bruce saying, Steve Bruce said it, not me. I think I think Wilshire was that type because of the way that he used to dribble and burst away from players. Certainly, same sort of physique as well. Definitely in that sort of mould. I, I I would have said that he was he was a lot closer to Gaza than than a, than a Grealish is actually because mm. Grealish is a different type of player where he can actually get himself into wide positions as well. Gaza was very much a central type player, able to pick passes out like like Wilshire. Injuries, of course, haven't been great for him. You're asking me how highly I rate him. Uh, I, I think he's, I think he's a yet yeah, very good player. Do I put him in the bracket of, of a Gaza of that type no, of player? No. Clearly not. No, no, no. but I, clearly I, not of the bracket of making the England World Cup squad in 2018, which is a far lower bracket. If I look at the like, you've got Dyer, you've got Henderson, you've got Livermore. Technically, he's more gifted than all three of those players. I'd feel. If you're looking at a John Joe Selvich, Shelby, he brings something different. Ruben Loftus-Cheek was another one I've heard mentioned in the last couple of weeks. I think he's a, a dark horse to be, to be named now in, in that England squad. I think he's an excellent footballer at Loftus-Cheek. But Wilshire is something different. He is he, he, he keeps hold of the ball well. I think he's able to dribble with the ball. He's not necessarily always looking to release it quickly. Mm. Uh, I think that's you've got similar types of players in, in England's midfield, and I think he brings something different to that midfield for them. But, um, so you take him? Yeah, I think you would. I personally, yeah, I think you would. I, I think again, fitness issues, all this sort of thing. Is it uh, is 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 he fit enough? I don't know, but I think if he is fit and he says he's fit and he feels fine, yes, I think I think South Gal uh, Gareth South South Galthgate, Gareth Southgate should be picking him. Yeah, <laughs> South Galthgate. <laughs> oh God, it's terrible that we work in this industry. All uh, right, John Brown. Good morning to you. How you doing? Good morning, lads. How are you? Who will South Galthgate pick? Uh, well, I think Sarath, uh, I don't think he's going to pick Jack Wilshire, uh, as Kevin was saying just there. Uh, I don't know if you've read the interesting uh, snippet in the London Times this morning. Uh, Matt Hughes, an excellent journalist, was saying that uh, when Wilshire went to the last couple of friendlies for England, uh, he withdrew officially with a knee injury, but actually 
his fitness was not up to the standards that Southgate required. So, you know, you're looking at that ahead of, of a tournament. Um, can Jack Wilshire last what potentially could be a six, seven game tournament? You'd have to say not. Um, also, just on, on that Kevin clip, the, the player that, that Kevin described perfectly, he perfectly described the player that Jack Wilshire used to be, uh, especially during that breakthrough. But the player I see now playing for Arsenal uh, is more the provocateur, gets stuck into tackles. He's lost that yard of pace to carry, to carry him away from other tackles. It's a real shame. England do need a creative midfielder. You look through the other players that uh, reporters have been picked. Nobody has the gifts that Wilshire, you've got to say, used to have. But uh, I, I, he's not going to be on that plane. He knows that now. That, that, that That's all out there. That's all out there. What, so just go back to the, him withdrawing from uh, the, the squad for those friendlies. England didn't believe that he was fit enough to last the 90 minutes in terms of his physical fitness or in terms of his knee holding up to the strain of playing 90 minutes? Well, I'd, the, the, the inference I got, I, I might be incorrect about this, is that there was, there was a knee problem, but it was actually his overall fitness. Right. So, it, it, that, um, listen, Jack Wilshire is, I mean, how long ago is it? He brings his breakthrough in 2010 or in 2018 now, He's probably lost three years of his career through injury. Um, you actually consider it, actually, last season he spent at Bournemouth. And by the end of that season, he wasn't even in their first team. This is a player who, who sadly degenerated through, um, well, it's got to be, he had ankle problems, he had foot problems. And then if he's getting knee problems, you know, that that tends to uh, be a byproduct of other problems that he has. Sadly, injuries, conditioning, whatever it is, have let a potentially great career go awry and you know with, with it all change at Arsenal you do wonder about his future. It does seem as well with Jack Wilshere and Joe Hart there's a sense of baggage around them and it's not so much what they can actually bring but the perception around them and it seems like Gareth Southgate is very keen on going into a major tournament with England without added baggage. Yeah yeah that's that's a, that's a good point um, I mean if you, if you if you were to read some of uh, the, the coverage of Joe Hart, written by, I'm going to politely call them his cheerleaders. They will tell you that Joe Hart is a great character to have around the dressing room. Uh, and from what I understand, he can be that, but he certainly is an ego. Now, let's face it, if the number one goalkeeper having an ego, that's accepted in football. But the number three goalkeeper, a guy that's not going to play, that's a big problem. So in Joe Hart's case... I think it was thought he's not he's not even the top two goalkeepers. There's no real point in taking him. And also, having said that, there is there is the idea that the idea that I've heard is that um, Southgate did want to take Hart, was considering him, still felt he was a good enough goalkeeper. Then unfortunately, he went to watch him play uh, for West Ham, uh, and I think the performance against Burnley was indicative, and that was pretty much the end of that. <laughs> That's unfortunate when uh, your manager goes to watch you play and it turns out you're just as crap as uh, you look on TV. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. But apparently it's David Moyes' fault. That's what uh, some of the newspapers are suggesting today, that um, he's got a, a case against David Moyes for his um, being dropped by the England manager. Like, I, I made the point earlier that this is actually Joe Hart blaming everybody else repeatedly and that's what we've come to expect from him. Uh, you know, he, he was clearly fabulously gifted, the, the perfect prototype for a goalkeeper, but I don't, it doesn't look like he had the application or the football intelligence to get the most out of those physical gifts. Yeah, that's right. Uh, when we think of Joe Hart's problems as a goalkeeper, the first one is that uh, how often is he beaten to the left-hand side? That's the weakness that, uh, that people talk about all the time. The second thing is the fact that Pep Guardiola arrived at Manchester City, took, let's say, I was, I was going to say one look at him, maybe two or three, and decided that he wasn't the goalkeeper of Manchester City. Now, there's two things there. There's one that, you know, the, the Joe Hart, the big character, Pep Guardiola wanted people who perhaps wouldn't be disruptive. And also, there's the fact that goalkeeping has changed, a player needs to be able to, a goalkeeper needs to play the ball out and so on. And Hart, it is said, was not particularly receptive to that. Um, so Manchester City went down the Claudio Bravo route, and that's another story. But, yes, if we, if we go to David Moyes, um, David Moyes is a manager of a team that is trying to stay in the Premier League, uh, has a pretty weak squad. Um, 
He, uh, as is pretty well documented, he hasn't had a lot of money spent on his team. And they've actually got a good goalkeeper in Adrian, um, a pretty serviceable goalkeeper who played very well for Sam Allardyce in particular at West Ham. And he chose Adrian as the goalkeeper. Now, I think that when Joe Hart went to West Ham on loan from Manchester City, he thought he'd be first choice goalkeeper. But as we mentioned with the Gareth Southgate thing, if you're not playing well enough, you don't deserve to be in the team. It's simple as that. We can, uh, if Jack Wiltshire is at Arsenal next season, it's all up in the air this week regarding who his manager might be. It might actually be a former teammate of his in Mikel Arteta, which I think when this story first developed, I think people took a little bit of a, a step back. But suddenly since Massimiliano Allegri has sort of ruled himself out of the picture because of the management structure at Arsenal, it seems that inexperience is going to be the only thing that will get you into that Arsenal job because once you look around the club, <coughs> once you see the structure of the club, you start to think to yourself, oh God, this could be a nightmare job. Mikel Arteta, is he ready for this? Well, uh, a manager, well, let's call him, can we call him a manager yet? He's actually not, he's managed no mm. professional games, as far as I can gather. Um, but the, the guy that takes this job on um, is stepping into this, the, the, uh, the shoes of someone who managed the club for 22 years, a club icon and all that. And as so often in uh, football management decisions, is the exact opposite of what Arsenal appointed or had before. Um, now, I think we've known over the last few months that um, Arsenal's, I suppose, structure has been growing around Arsene Wenger to the point where eventually he was shoved away from it, that he, he would no longer have a part in the club. Um, and, I, and I think the Allegri thing is interesting because it does look like Allegri... It, they're never going to admit that Allegri was first choice, but the fact that negotiations are taking place with a manager who has won, is it four uh, titles in a row now? Four doubles, it, it, silly. <clears throat> I think it might even be four doubles in a row. Uh, you know, that is a top-grade manager. Uh, he's been to the Champions League final. And then suddenly they end up with Mikel Arteta. You've got to say that Arteta is the second choice there, haven't you? You have to say that. So what, what you've got is you've almost gone for the opposite of Allegri because Allegri is a guy who wants to perhaps run the club from top to bottom, or they will be used to a, a sporting director structure having worked in Italy. Uh, but he, what he thought, it would seem that the structure at Arsenal was too overbearing for even someone used to work in the Italian structure to work in. So essentially, they Arsenal are trying to reinvent the wheel a little bit by getting a coach in who is inexperienced, but... Uh, learned under at the feet of such great managers as Pep Guardiola, Arsene Wenger himself. Uh, he also learned under Alex McLeish, David Moyes. And, you know, it does seem to me that they are taking a risk, but uh, Arteta as an individual is said to be one of those people who had set out for management some years ago. Uh, a pretty forceful character, despite the fact he seems quite placid. Um, and, you know, it's it said to have the grit and determination to make it as a manager. Mm. Now, it does seem to me at that point, you're talking about some kind of Pep Guardiola light option, and I think many clubs have looked at that over the years, but Arsenal are taking a hell of a risk here. Um, the, the, the idea is that after the Wenger thing, it's the top six. They can't really fall below the top six, so it's something of a shot to nothing for the next manager. And because of how, things, how badly things have gone for Arsenal... But, you know, I've been to Arsenal quite a bit. I know the way things go. When things start going badly, uh, the, you know, even going back to before the Arsenal Wenger days, the criticism does start to rain down. So that's a hell of a pressure job for someone to take on first time out. Yeah, for sure. I think as well when you look at, the, you mentioned the risk there and that Arsenal potentially can't drop out of the top six. Well, like, I mean, you look at Manchester United and the risks they took with David Moyes and how low they fell. I mean, if Arsenal were to succumb to some sort of similar thing, it would be a disaster at the club. But we want to stay with the, the London clubs for just a moment and we want to move on to Chelsea because Aidan Hazard is dominating the back pages this morning. He's saying that Chelsea need to buy big this summer if he is going to renew his contract at the club. And I was making the point a little bit earlier on in the show that if you remove hindsight from the situation that Chelsea were in last summer and you look at the signings they did make, I'm sure Hazard was looking around the dressing room in August, looking at the likes of Bakayoko and Mar and thinking to himself, these are the best sort of players we could possibly sign and things might be okay. It hasn't turned out as such and I can't see Chelsea upping the ante in terms of the level of player they can sign this summer. 
No, no. Um, I, I think the signs are. I mean, Chelsea spent big uh, last summer, but they spent big on a lot of players uh, and never really landed a big one. Though you have to say the price tags for Bakayoko and Murata are actually quite big. But what I think what you've got with Chelsea that you're slightly operating in this thing where having been the richest kid in town, there's something of a poor little rich kid. They can't go out and buy Neymar. They can't go out and buy, uh, you know, Antoine Griezmann or players like that these days. Um, Eden Hazard is talking about the fact that uh, the club are inconsistent and sometimes it's not happening for them. Well, he could be talking about himself personally at that point, couldn't he? Because Hazard, I think we'd all agree would probably be among the top three most gifted players in the Premier League, but still hasn't turned it around consistently. You know, he's, he's had one great season, then he's had a poor season, then he, I mean, this season you'd have to say he'd had an OK season, but nothing compared to the previous season. Um, at a certain point, when players say things like that, do they look to themselves and think, you know, maybe I should have been the guy going out inspiring the players as I am supposed to be the best player? That doesn't seem to have been the case with Hazard. He's looking for the exit. I think he's 27, so, you know, the last big move. Uh, many many times over, we've talked about the fact that he might be looking at Real Madrid. Perhaps that chance has gone. Uh, PSG uh, is a club that might interest him. To me, those comments look like a, a player putting himself up at tender and a player dissatisfied with Chelsea. The way things are at Chelsea... Uh, with the way things at the manager are. It does seem open season for people to be able to say how bad things are. When they get the next manager in, that'll probably change. Whether Hazard's a part of it, I don't know. For Chelsea to spend big, they might have to sell Hazard to actually be able to do that. Uh, When I move on to the situation at Everton, it looked like Big Sam and Everton was uh, perhaps a match made in heaven, I thought at the start. Owen correctly identified that that wasn't going to work out. What a shock. Um, Marco Silva, though, Certainly that looks like an upgrade and somebody who everybody could get behind and really believe that the club have the right manager and some of the infrastructure that you need to be the sixth best team in the Premier League. Mm, yes. Uh, well, I, I question your original judgment there, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> <I, I, laughs> the thing is, uh, Allardyce and Everton, one of the strange things about that move when he, when he went there was... They needed a manager to save the club. But all it took was a couple of games to pull them out of the safety. Pull them to safety, and then what what do we have? Well, you've got a season of Sam Allardyce football. And Everton, like so many places, is a demanding support base. And Allardyce has made himself very unpopular there. I think you actually consider the, the comments that he's made over the season. I think one of the things... I think they fall into two stools. I think there's a case where he could you could be saying that he is uh, he's almost trolling the fans by talking about how good the football is and how great the you know how great things are at the club and how he wants to stay forever. And then there's a personal pride thing. I think one of the things that I do know about Samuel Dice is that he was really hurt by what happened by England. He never thought that he would get uh, a big club again. And Everton, historically, to someone of Sam Allardyce's age, that's a big club. But it hasn't worked out for him because, unfortunately, leopards don't change the spots. Old, you know, old dogs don't learn new tricks. And Sam Allardyce brought his brand of football to Everton, a place where the fans don't want that. Moving on to Marco Silva, um, that is one of those things where um, I was at uh, a game back in November, I'd say, where Marco Silva was pretty much nailed on to go to Everton. It was at this point they were negotiating how much the compensation was going to be. I think the next day, actually, uh, Watford pulled out of that deal and then got very annoyed with Everton. I think there's going to be some compensation owing, even though they they sacked Silva not long after that game, actually. Um, Silva himself, uh, I saw quite a bit of him at Hull last season, started off very impressively, uh, but then... When it actually came to it, Hull had the chance to pull themselves out of safety uh, and they blew it. They lost 2-0 to Sunderland. But Watford, they played some great football at the start of the season, uh, but then things started to come awry. Uh, I think if you actually look at his away record as a manager, it's absolutely hopeless uh, in, in English football. I'm not sure that Marco Silva 
it's quite the golden ticket that Farhad Mashiri, the Everton owner, appears to think it is. Um, that's an interesting one. I think Everton as a club could do better than uh, as a manager than Marco Silva. One of the people mentioned uh, is Paolo Fonseca, the Shakhtar manager, who uh, you might have seen pictures of him uh, his, him in a car coming out of um, David Sullivan's mansion the other day, the West Ham owner. Um, so he's a man in demand. It's whether Everton or West Ham are the bigger call. Uh, for me, I'll go to Everton over West Ham. Uh, the second last thing we want to talk to you about this morning, uh, John, is Pep Guardiola. He was on Monday Night Football on a Tuesday night last night, chatting about yes. uh, the season as a whole. There, there wasn't a whole amount of explosivity about what he was talking about. He kind of looked into some of the things, the secrets behind it, but not really. And he talked about you know having a target on their back next season. And I guess the most interesting thing uh, that Pep talked about last night was Manchester United and how he actually enjoys watching Manchester United play, which... I guess you could say is just you know being generous to his nearest rivals, doesn't want to give anything away, doesn't want to get too ahead of himself and kind of slam Jose Mourinho because there's no reward in that after you've just had one of the greatest Premier League seasons in history. I think that Pep Guardiola genuinely is intrigued by how Jose Mourinho sets up with his Manchester United team. I would go as far as to say that he's almost confused by it, but that doesn't mean <laughs> that he's not entertained by it. Yeah, it, it's almost like, uh, it, I don't know, how would you put this? Uh, he, he's trying to, yeah, he's trying to understand something that is completely anathema to him. Uh, like read, reading a book by a politician of, of a different um, leaning to you. You know, like me read, I'm, I once read Margaret Thatcher's Downing Street Years, for example, something like that. Um, you know, it, it, it just, um, yes, I watched a bit of that last night and um, Pep Guardiola said, Actually, I found quite engaging uh, and quite honest, actually. There was one point where um, he was asked about the style of play that he'd chosen and the, the tactics that he'd chosen, which were you know, about, about, about closing teams down and then attacking all, all at once and, and all that type of thing. And he gave what I thought was a, a very honest answer, which was, um, well, you know, how, what changed between your first season at Manchester City to the second season? And he actually said, money. Money was to what changed him. You know, people people say that, but I can't deny the fact that we were able to able to buy better players with the amount of money we spent. So that was very honest, actually, very honest, uh, and I was quite impressed by that. But I wasn't as impressed by it as Gary Neville, who looked like he was learning at the feet of some kind of you know deity. You know, he was completely and utterly in awe of Pep Guardiola. Perhaps that's as a, as a measure of his own. Uh, misadventures in management or you know his own interest in coaching but uh yeah was i suppose the thing that i did notice was how much gary neville took from that particular tv program we started by talking about the england world cup squad we're going to finish by talking about two squads who believe they've got a, a realistic chance of winning it uh, and that is brazil and argentina uh, apparently leo messi is effectively a selector at this point but uh the big news really is that neymar is going to be fit to play in the world cup um what are the odds on Neymar breaking Messi's heart? Uh, I, I mean, Brazil, Brazil. you know, if you'd gone back six months ago, you would have said Brazil were clear favourites under the, new, the coach that they've got, uh, the, the standard of play that, that, that they were producing. How do we pronounce his name? Is it Chiche, the coach? I think that's right, isn't it? Yes. Um, but anyway, the, um, but then Danny Alves breaks down in the French Cup final last week. Neymar is essentially doing uh, a Wayne Rooney 2006, coming back from a broken foot. We all remember how that ended up. Um, I think Argentina's greatest problem is Argentina. Um, a, a phalanx of attacking stars. Um, but in defence, you know, Argentina, I always think of the team of great defenders, you know, uh, Roberto Ayala, Daniel Passarella, those type of players... Um, they just don't have those type of players these days. They, they're just not that great in defence. Um, and Javier Mascherano, a player that I hugely respect, is certainly past his best. So, you know, um, Brazil and Argentina are always the favourites, aren't they, going into these tournaments? But I think both of them have their problems. And uh, what you've got, actually, the fact you mentioned Neymar and Messi are just two huge I suppose, international conglomerates running countries for them in, in those two players. 
Uh, I would be very interested to see Neymar's performances in some of the friendlies if he's going to appear in any of them. Yeah. Like we, we, obviously we were very excited about the World Cup and that's what we're kind of most looking forward to if Neymar and Messi do cross paths because of the story that we've had over the past 24 hours that we do have a realistic possibility that Neymar is going to join Real Madrid. Messi's already been on the record about this. He says he has told Neymar or he says I've already told him what I think and I think uh, you and I John we can both kind of guess what Messi thinks about Neymar yeah. joining Real Madrid. I think Neymar will be at the top of uh, Messi's hatred list should he actually join Real Madrid. It is a rivalry we need it will only make La Liga even better than it already is. Neymar joining Real Madrid would be brilliant for football, but bad for Lionel Messi's feelings, I guess. I'm sure he'll get over it. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the thing, the thing is, Neymar and Cristiano Ronaldo are they going to have to build two dressing rooms? I mean, <laughs> that that is going to be um, that is going to be interesting, uh, and I also. I can't believe I'm saying this. I have some element of sympathy for PSG. I mean, they, they've been pretty much used as a uh, as a holding pen for Neymar over the, over the past year. Uh, he picked up an injury, um, and then um, the story I rem remember actually was when they when when PSG were actually playing uh, Real Madrid in the in the Champions League, um, and they were trying to I suppose kid on uh, Real that Neymar might play. The Brazilian Football Federation held a press conference to announce that Neymar's season was over and that he won't be able to play anymore. That football, football for them. I think PSG have been used and abused, perhaps, perhaps willingly in a certain point, but by Neymar. Um, if I'm honest, uh, I wouldn't want Neymar anywhere near a club that I supported because I think he is problematic. It may not actually be the individual himself, but certainly the circus around him is a big problem for me. So I wish Real Madrid good luck with him. I really do. Good stuff, John. Thanks a million. Cheers. Cheers, lads. John Brewer in there giving us uh, some thoughts on that. A point I completely botched at the end there, but anyway. They didn't botch anything. It was great to get our little Argentina versus Brazil World Cup preview coming on. So uh, I'm not sure what odds Argentina are now. Uh, I presume they've moved out dramatically because, you know, I was all on the Messi hype bandwagon in January, February. And uh, they were at 9-1. to one. I think they may have drifted to like 11 or 12. But then you look at their squad and all their defenders are terrible defenders, which is always uh, a good sign when you're backing a team to win the World Cup. I'll oh, check out their best price at 11, but they're 9 most places. So oh, not that still there. Good. Yeah. Um, and obviously we did talk good detail about the Brazil World Cup squad last night with Tim Vickery on the radio. So if you want more details on that, you can go and check it. Now, uh, we're going to talk with Patrick Donnell and Clare's 2013 All-Ireland winning captain in just a minute. But first, uh, let's hear some Austin Gleeson, who was on last night, talking about... Uh, hurler of the year stuff. Looking back on it, I shouldn't have. I, sh I shouldn't have been doing that. Um, the whole year just bypassed them because I was doing that, and it was it was a stupidity mindset out of my out of my own thoughts. Like, and I don't know why I done it. Um, it's understandable. I, I suppose it was just so. there was so much around the awards. Um, he shouldn't have got it. He should have got it. Different things like that. You, so you you obviously read stuff. So people were saying you shouldn't have got it, were they? I didn't notice that. I didn't see any of that. There, yeah, it was. There was a kind of, but it wasn't. It wasn't me kind of reading. It was more so. Again, the people on the street saying, "Oh, do you hear what this fella said? Do you hear what that fella said?" And I'm saying, "I'm kind of stand there. I don't really want to know, but go on." Well, well, like, like, so, uh, did you hear what Pundit X said? Yeah, and they tell you on the street. Basically, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and that kind of that sows a seed in your head. You're thinking, "Oh, there's people out there saying." Yeah, basically, and then I I wanted to prove a point. Then basically, the following year that. I, uh, I wanted, I wanted to prove a point that I, I, I believe that I was good that year. Yeah. Um, that maybe <laughs> they deserved the awards that year, or whatever. Like, but it just didn't, just didn't happen. No matter what I tried, <coughs> um, just didn't come off for me. Um, were you enjoying? Were you not enjoying it? Would you go that far? I wouldn't say I wasn't enjoying it. It was more so. I was. What's the, what's the word? Um, I was. I was enjoying what I was enjoying playing. I was enjoying going training, but the second one thing went wrong, I was zoned out for game for five minutes, um, and I couldn't get back into the game because I, th I was thinking, if I missed a catch, why did I miss that catch? I probably would have made it last year. So I was thinking back on previous instead of just looking forward. And, and does the, the about does it. the pundit flash across your mind saying, "Oh, he's going to clock"? They're going to pick that out. They're going to pick this out. Yeah, yeah, it does. They prefer, but. Yeah, brilliant stuff from Austin Gleeson last night, uh, speaking with Joe, obviously you can see the whole thing 
Check out youtube.com forward slash off the ball for our extended interviews. And make sure you hit subscribe on that so anytime that we go live with good stuff, you'll get a notification. Um, you can also, of course, get our stuff on facebook.com forward slash off the ball. And OTB AM is brought to you this morning with Air, the home of Air Sport, and amazing live sporting content free with Air Broadband. Now, we are moving on. Uh, Patrick Donald on the line to talk to us a little bit about what's happening this weekend. Good morning to you. Good morning, guys. How are you doing? Um, so... We were having a debate about uh, this earlier on, about which game is the best game. It's great that we have two brilliant games this weekend, was the conclusion that we came to. Um, and the Munster Championship is starting with a bang. Yeah, absolutely. Look, and I suppose from, from my point of view, obviously the Clare Cork one is the, is the one I'd be focused on. Um, I suppose the game last weekend between Dublin and Kilkenny kind of really is after whetting everybody's appetite, kind of getting everybody looking forward to, to the Championship. And, and, you know, nothing like the, the White Eater Munster Championship, I suppose, to look forward to and hopefully... Hopefully a good season for Clare. Yeah, the obvious conclusion from last weekend is that the league didn't really matter a damn when it came to the quality of performance that we can expect from the various teams in the league. And yet there's enough from the league, for particularly from Clare fans, I guess, for them to be particularly excited about this team and this management setup and what might be possible. Yeah, Clare, I suppose Clare had a, an unusual league campaign. They probably did a good start. Um, whether it was intentional or not, they kind of seemed maybe to go all out at the start of the league maybe and, and try and set their stall down very quickly and then they probably faded a little bit towards the end um, but yeah I think I think in Clare look there wasn't a, a huge amount of experimentation, experimentation to be done they probably know their, their best 15 they probably knew it at the start of the year it was just a case of getting people settled into positions and making sure they were performing you know and I think Clare from a Clare point of view I, I think they'll be um, they'll be confident enough going in on Sunday and they'll they'll know what's ahead of them and I suppose they'll know what they have you know, in term in the tank themselves, and it's just a matter of actually producing it on the day. And, and, and I'd say they'll be confident enough that that if everything goes their way, that they'll they'll be thereabouts. Yeah. So the, the last time Clare managed to get one over Cork in the championship uh, was a game in 2013, which you might recall yourself. It was an All Ireland final replay. Like, what's happened to Clare in these games against Cork in previous years? Has there been kind of a real emphasis from Cork to get revenge time and time again, or has has it just been Clare not being up to the mark post 2013? Yeah, no, I think it's definitely clear of not being up to the mark, you know, I suppose it's just, it's something, even talking to a few guys during the week, it's just the Munster Championship for the last couple of years for Clare, um, and maybe in general, even before that, just just hasn't been something that Clare have been uh, been producing, um, seem to kind of find our feet a little bit more maybe in the in the All-Ireland series afterwards when you get a bit of a run of games, but for the Munster Championship, kind of preparing for a one game after five or six months training, it just, uh, Clare teams just don't seem to perform, I, I, I don't know what it is, maybe um, just just hasn't suited, um, but Clare, Tipperary, you know, Limerick, they've, Waterford, they've all been more consistent than Clare in in uh, in uh, the Munster Championship in recent years, I suppose. And that's that's something that I suppose I would have had regrets with myself even uh, playing with Clare. I would have loved to have played in, in the Munster final, uh, more Munster finals, or definitely won a Munster final, um, or at the very least been more consistent. So, look, hopefully the guys can can get that consistency with the new format. I think it'll help them having a game week to week uh, will allow them to kind of get it get into the groove a little bit easier and if you know something goes wrong one day you've, a, you've another match coming fairly quickly so it should suit them. Why was the team not con more consistent over the years Patrick? Looking back what, what's your take on that now? I honestly don't know Jaren. I look, we, we would have talked about it a lot with, with the, the lads in the team and the management and things over the years. I, 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 maybe the only kind of general conclusion we could come to is that maybe we, we, we went a little bit maybe too hard um, in the league. Uh, I think Clare probably had a tendency maybe to, to, to treat the league as a second championship when I think in reality the league is it's a preliminary com competition you need to be getting you know a few little things out of it but you know it's not really the end of the world if, if, if you don't win the league or if you don't kind of do well in it you know you want to find one or two players you want to get a little bit of consistency you want to try things out um, and maybe after 2013 especially I think we kind of felt like we had to do a bit more um, to kind of stay on top and, and, and I suppose it was kind of Kind of a catch twenty two. The more we did, then the kind of less we seemed to perform on the days. And look, it's hard to put your finger on it. I don't know because everything was being done for the right reasons. But I think maybe going a little bit too hard early in the year definitely didn't help us. Then when when the championship actually came around. Yeah, because th there's the year that you guys reached the league final and look like you've got it won against Waterford and then end up having the replay in the extra time. And it really felt like at that stage both teams were going to use that as a springboard. But yeah. in the end, it seemed like that took a lot out of both sides. It did, and that, that's it. I think you see, we we were training for the league as if it was, you know, the the, the championship, or, or or you know, just before the championship. When in reality, you, you you really, in my point of view, the league and championship are totally unrelated. And you see that last week. You know, Kilkenny obviously did very well in the league, um, but in 
in championship intensity, you know, teams are just a different animal, and it just it just it's 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 so evident on the field. You know, the players are are that half step faster, the ball is going a lot quicker, things just happen an awful lot quicker. So you, you really need to go into them from my point of view with a different mindset. Get a, whatever you want for the league, but it's not really the end of the world if, if things don't go exactly to plan. But the, the championship that day on the first of June or the twentieth of May, as it is for Clare now, is is the be all end all for the year. Would you then suggest that in the context of this weekend, the game in the league where Clare looked far superior than Cork for large swathes of that game is largely irrelevant? Yeah, I, I would. In general, I think the league is very irrelevant. What, what you're what you're trying to get out of the league, what I would be trying to get out of the league is, you know, you're blooding a few new, you, new young players. You're you're getting them maybe used to to playing um, against people that they'll be meeting in the championship. Getting them, you know, giving them a chance to kind of find their feet, you know, and maybe a couple of lads are coming back from injuries and things like that. But you're in reality, you're using it as a training tool to prepare you for a championship. And um, so, whether you lose by five points, win by ten points. I wouldn't be reading too much into it, um, because you know you, the championship is is such a step up from anything you'll do in the league or, or any training you'll do that it's 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 kind of unrelated in a way. Yeah, uh, like I think especially this year because of the new format, I'd say most managers were looking at the league going, churn the players through, get them in, get them out, make sure that everybody has a base level of fitness, and yeah. even over the next couple of weeks, I suspect that we're going to see huge changes in teams and an evolution of playing style in championship because finally. The weather will be good. It's also been the longest winter that we've ever seen. So, I like I. There's a genuine sense of discovery. I suspect this weekend and over the next couple of weeks in Munster in particular. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's it's. I suppose it's unusual, and it's exciting in a way. In that, you know, you essentially have the four rounds of the championship being played off in a month. So you could have a player maybe that wasn't performing in the league, but he's just coming into a bit of form now, and he could be a powerhouse for a month. In the, in the championship and he could be one of your main players who you know maybe four three or four months ago in the first round of the league you might have thought he was he was um he was in contention at all so it's look i think it just it's really building up for an exciting summer and like you say you know the real summer hurling starting a little bit early will help everybody and then having the week to week game will just it'll it'll raise the levels i think for every county notwithstanding all that i still think that uh, there's something in this cork team i'm not entirely sure what it is but i'm i would be concerned if i was Clare fan this weekend yeah, absolutely. Well, look, we, we don't have a great record against Cork, um, so we, we're, there, there'll always be concerns, I suppose. But from a Clare point of view, you know, you can kind of, without analysing the other teams too much, looking internally, we, we have a very good group of players. You'd have confidence in the lads that if they produce the display that they want to produce, that I, I think they have a, a, a more quality than Cork on the day. But at the same time, Cork have that consistency. They have been playing better in the Munster Championship uh, for the last couple of years, much better than Clare. Um, so you know you can never you're never going to write anyone off, and definitely not in the Munster Championship, and especially now with the with the home and away games, you know going down to play Cork and Park and Heave and teams coming up to Cusick Park to play Clare, you're never going to be going in overly confident. But I suppose if if you have that sense of confidence that you can produce what you need to produce, then you know you're hopeful you're hopeful that your quality will take over. Now, when it comes to the other game this weekend, you've got uh, Tipperary against Limerick. Tip joint favourites at the moment with both with most uh, bookmakers alongside Galway to win the All Ireland. Do you feel that they're worthy of that favourites tag that Tipperary, despite what happened in the league final, are still viewed by most people in the country as a team to beat? Yeah, I, I, I would, to be honest. Yeah, and if you look at their squad, they have they have a lot of a lot of depth, you know, and they're they're probably one of the teams during the league that you know they did try out a lot of new players, they had new faces, um, people that we probably wouldn't have seen as as, as central players were, were were kind of consistently there, you know, and they have the other players to come back then, you know. Um, that they were phasing in and out like Shamie Callan and Noel McGrath and things like that and Bubbles was only in for a little bit at the end so they're, they have a very strong panel I think they're, they're, they're the team at the moment that seems like to have the most strength and depth and like this or with this new format now from a week to week basis you know you might need three or four new players to be stepping in um, come the third or fourth game and you need them to be you know, equal to what was there before and, and they do seem to have that strength and depth at the moment more than any other county what about Limerick's uh, underage success in, in recent years? Obviously, the Clare team that you were a part of it had that backbone of teams that had come through and were actually able to get over the line eventually as senior All-Ireland champions. This Limerick team is backboned again by a, a superb vein of players over a number of years. But we've seen in Limerick before that they've had significant issues getting uh, ultimate senior success, notwithstanding brilliant under-21 teams before. So is something going to be different this time, do you think? Yeah, they seem they look like an extremely exciting team to watch. To be honest, um, and it's yeah, it's very like Claris was in that you know it hasn't been a gradual introduction of a couple of players. There's a, there's a lot of new players after coming into the team this year and maybe towards the end of last year, which is it's probably unusual 
you know, in, in a general sense, but like what, what Claire did a couple of years ago. But all those players are good players. They're, they're worthy of being at that level. So Limerick, Limerick are, a, are a strong team this year. Um, young guys like that playing with freedom and expressing themselves can be can be a different challenge to, to an established senior player. So it's it, it can be difficult playing a team like that. And if they get into their rhythm, I would be 100% sure that they won't lack in any confidence. They'll be very well prepared physically. Uh, they'll be a very well organised team so they'll they'll be a team that will, will be quietly fencing their chances and as well the home and away format going into play Limerick and the Gaelic grounds you're not never going to get an easy game in there so they'll fancy their chances with their two home games and then you know if they pick up another win then, then they're in the mix the same as everybody else Patrick no doubt everybody in Clare is keeping a very close eye on what the hell's going on in Wexford's uh, unbelievable success last year from Davies' perspective, the massive crowd that we saw at the Leinster Hurling final was a, a real shot in the arm for the game generally right across the country. It felt like there was kind of a, a sense of at least finally Leinster is beginning to become a province uh, where there's proper competition. We see that again with Dublin, hopefully. So um, can Davy get this team to an All-Ireland semi-final this year, do you think? Oh, yeah, I think he definitely can. Look, it, 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 I think it's very clear from Davy when he goes in somewhere that he has an, an immediate impact. You know, he had it last year. Um, and they seem to be they seem to be progressing again this year. Um, I suppose they're they're physically they seem like a very strong team. They seem very very fit. Obviously, with Davy involved, they they won't be lacking in any uh, physical endurance or anything like that. Um, but they do seem to be well organised this year. Um, and from watching a couple of their games last year, I suppose it, you know the sweeper thing was was a new a new format maybe for them, and, and they'd latched onto that. But from watching some of their games this year, their, their forward movement seems a little bit better. Um, and they seem to be a little bit more clinical up front, and they seem to be be getting a bit more out of themselves because playing that system, you know, the day will come when it when it really does tighten up and your five forwards are un, will be under pressure up front. So you need your five forwards to be, to be producing a lot. Um, and they seem to have kind of tailored that a little bit more this year. So it, I think Wexford will fancy their chances um, the home games down in Innovate Park, unbelievably hard to to to, to win, uh, to win against them. I suppose the difficult thing for them is that they have Kilkenny away in the last game. So they, if they get a good start um, and win their first couple of games, they, they they they'll be in good shape. But if they're under a bit of pressure going down to Nolan Park on the last day, it'll be it'll be very interesting. People seem to talk about Davy Fitzgerald in the context of Jose Mourinho sometimes, where it's like in the second season, good things will happen, as you guys saw yourself in Clare. It is obviously his second season with Wexford. Was there any particular reason why it was year two that things went so well for Davy and Clare? Um, uh, no, I don't think so. I think you look at, I suppose, the, the manager's first year in any in any job, I suppose it's, it, a lot of it is setting the groundwork, it's, it's getting the, the structures in place, it's getting the the physical conditioning right so you know you're going to get a bounce in the second year when guys have you know put on the extra bit of muscle mass and they have that extra fitness and they have the extra understanding of the systems and so on so you know the first year you'll get an, you'll, you'll get an immediate impact and the guys will be enthusiastic and then in the second year you'll get the, the more real impact i suppose where where they're progressing and developing as players physically and and, and understanding the on the field system as well so they, they will be they will be really really looking forward to the championship um Davy will have, I suppose, a couple of new ideas, no doubt, um, and he'll be trying things out. And I suppose, you know, no more than watching Dublin and Kilkenny last week, the Leinster Championship is still very competitive. Um, I know people think the Munster Championship is extremely competitive, but home and away games in Leinster will give everybody a, a real, real chance, um, and it'll it'll suit the likes of Wexford. And you know, it's it's it just makes for a really cha uh, exciting championship opener, especially when 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 they're involved and and Fitz is involved, obviously. How are you finding not being involved? This is your first uh, proper championship weekend without being involved since 2006. Yeah, I, I don't mind it, to be honest with you. It's, it's a big change, but um, uh, look, I, I assume now when the ball's running on Sunday that I'll be itching and I'll be I'll be trying to itch back out or inch back out on towards the field. But um, I, I don't really miss it from that point of view because, you know, you obviously you miss the games, but you, you realise that if you're not part of it, you, you can't just miss the games. You have to do the, the hard training that goes with it and the sacrifices and so on. So I, I can't say that I miss it a whole pile, but... Definitely. When I see the teams uh, walking around the parade and the national anthem played on Sunday, I'll be, uh, I'll be wishing I was out there. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I don't think I'll be much help them now at this stage. To be uh, too many, too many legs in the field now for someone like me. And is it was that the case? Like, because you, you had a cruciate and you came back from it, you got back involved, and obviously that's very hard to do at any stage of your career. But certainly, when you are a veteran or reach the veteran stage of your career, I mean, still early, in your early thirties, it seems ridiculous to be calling people a veteran. But you know what I mean that. Like yeah. there probably comes a point where you realise that actually I've I've done my time. Yeah, that was it. And see, I I was luckiest was I didn't just wake up and, and, and kind of give up um 
give up the sport. I kind of had a gradual process. Look, I was, I had the injury. The year I had the injury, I was planning on giving it up anyway. So I had done a lot of training that year um, in the hope that, look, I, I just said I'd give it one last lash and see see what I could get out of it. So when I had the injury, I didn't want to leave like that. So I came back last year again. But in, I, I, look, I, I knew it was going to be my last year anyway. And then I suppose with the new management team taking over, I knew it was going to be difficult for, for an older player to come back in as one of the mainstays, if you like. They were probably always going to give you know, the, the, the youth, the benefit of the doubt, which is, which is the right thing to do because, you know, they're looking to the future and, and you know, getting, um, getting, getting, or giving someone like me, I suppose, a, a chance back into the team probably wasn't going to be any kind of a long-term plan for them. So I was, I was happy I went back there, to be honest, but it, it was a natural progression for me. And I was, I was, uh, I had made peace with, I suppose, long before I actually, I actually retired. Patrick, best, best of luck with it. Uh, enjoy the weekend. Thanks very much for talking to us this morning. Thanks, lads. Patrick Donlan, the uh, All-Ireland winning captain of the Clare Hurlers in 2013, talking to us about this weekend. What do you think is going to happen? I think Tipperary are going to win. I think Tipperary are going to win Munster. I think Tipperary are going to win the All-Ireland. Um, on the other side of things, I wouldn't be surprised to see Clare do it against Cork. I mean, do Cork get back to an All-Ireland semi-final this year? I'd be kind of surprised if they did. Like, I think we're forgetting the, the sleeping giant that is Waterford yet to come back. And I think you will have... I think you will have two from each province in the All-Ireland semi-finals, which will be Galway, Tip, um, Kilkenny and Waterford as your All-Ireland semi-finalists. I think Cork will sneak through to the All-Ireland quarter-finals, um, get dumped out there because, of course, with the, the seeding, with the Joe McDonough Cup winners and all that sort of stuff, um, they'll have a harder route through unless they finish top of the, the Munster table. Um, and you probably suspect that you'll have someone like Wexford sneaking through in Leinster. Will they be able to make it to a semi-final as we discussed with Patrick Donnellan there? It might just be a year too soon. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this weekend. Um, I can see Limerick... I don't know. I'd, I wouldn't be entirely shocked if Limerick won that game. Well, what was it? The league semi-final, wasn't it, that uh, Tipperary beat them? That was a pretty cracking game. Like They needed that unbelievable sideline puck from Ronan Maher, I think, to give them a bit of breathing space, if I remember that game correctly. They had a late goal as well. Limerick stayed with them. Of course, as we've just established, league form isn't really that important. It, they're an unbelievably exciting team. Yeah, that's the uh, thing. Like the, there, there's want, no question I, about that. I want, I want a breakthrough team. It would be brilliant. Limerick are going to be that breakthrough team if there is going to be one. Hopefully, yeah. I mean, did Cork count as a breakthrough team? No. Like, like, they got to do an, an all-around all semi-final yeah. last year. They won Munster last year. I know, but like, out of nowhere. Did Clare yes, count as th a, that was a breakthrough, breakthrough team? Uh, probably, yeah, but will they break through? Mm, I don't know. All right, up next we're talking athletics, particularly marathon running with uh, Lizzie Lee and Katrina Jennings plus Sue Murphy from Off the Bench. In 2018, the SSE Airtricity Dublin Marathon will mark the, uh, and celebrate female participation linking with the nationwide commemoration of Votal 100. Votal Cage, is that it? Is, that, is, that, is there a correct Irish terminology for it? I presume so. I presume you're close to being correct there anyway. Constance uh, Markovic, a key campaigner for Irish women's voting rights, obviously, will appear on the SSE Airtricity Dublin Marathon finishers medal, which could yet be Owen Sheehan's. The Dublin Marathon has attracted women of all ages and fitness levels from around Ireland and across the globe over the years. Uh, female participation was just 3% in 1980. In 2017, that was 35%. And the goal this year is to increase it again to 40%. Here's Lizzie Lee and Katrina Jennings with Owen and Sue. We joined the conversation on the topic of Ireland's, of training Ireland's next generation of endurance runners. You start to think about medals. You start to think about how can we turn our elite performers into people that we can put up in posters around the country and turn into gold, silver, or bronze medals. That is essentially what the cynic in all of us thinks, what the sport fan in all of us thinks. And like when you start thinking about that, like I was going to ask you about Paula Radcliffe because it's 15 years on since she broke uh, her world record, the one that still stands. Mm -hmm. And just doing a little bit more reading about it, she was saying that when she was 17 years old, she got pulled aside by a coach and was like, your VO2 max is off the charts you have to become a marathon runner. And I'm wondering, and I, I know this is quite a cynical thing because participation should be the most important thing, for our teenagers in Ireland who are showing a bit of promise at a young age, no matter what sport it is, that they have the, the physiological data in front of them to say, actually, do you know what? You're a sprinter, that's what you're doing, but you should actually think about more endurance because I've got your VO2 figures in front of me and you can be outstanding. I fully agree with, um, you know, pulling people, well, not necessarily pulling them aside, but identifying talent and, um, you know, nurturing that talent. 
I like I agree it's fantastic to have mass participation but at the end of the day people really do want to see Irish athletes achieve as well and I think you do have to start nurturing that at a you know at a teenage age and um, particularly for girls we were talking earlier about how there's a huge rate of attrition for girls through their teenage years and you know I think if um, if they were identified as being potential stars of the future at that point and really encouraged and you know, if they can see the results as they as they progress, I think that will be a huge reason for them to stay mm. and stay in the sport. So I think it goes for pretty much all Olympic sport, doesn't it? Because naturally, most of them are niche sports. I mean, people will naturally play team sports; they will always dominate. But there will be people who play team sports who won't achieve at the highest level of team sports because of a lack of skill. But there is going to be natural physiological data. What, what, what did you play actually? Everything. Yeah. <laughs> Quite badly. <laughs> uh, I was the utility player because I was always fit and I could run around the pitch. But I had <laughs> almost no skill. Well, um, rugby, basketball, I everything. I played, I mean, you name it, a lot of basketball, a lot of soccer. We were a soccer school, um, Bishop Sound Community School. Um, I, I played everything. I did water polo in college. was never brilliant at everything, but I just liked it. I just, mm. And then once I found the running, I, that was my passion. And it was what just was your encouragement away. around that? Because we were talking before about PE and PE in schools and not enough PE. girls continuing. What, where did you think the breakdown is with girls not continuing we, into... We had a brilliant PE teacher who it, was it just so inclusive it, yeah. and we had a really good girls soccer team that he built up. We won monster titles and things mm. um, and he built it up and it was within the school. It was just normal for a girl to play soccer and basketball yeah. and even you talk about identifying talent. Okay, I wasn't utter rubbish. Yeah. Um, I was pulled aside and brought to a, a club team at one point um, because I was doing well in the school team and it's, you know, there is a fostering and a nurturing there within the yeah. coaching um, and I think it's it's about making it normal for girls to play sport Absolutely, and yeah. making it acceptable um, and that will only happen by other girls playing sport you know yeah. what I mean um, and I go around to schools um, and I go around to them when they're young to try and instill this try everything make it fun sport is good sport is only going to be positive for your life you know and it's important they see you having and that conversation they, yeah, as well. yeah you know and I'm fine I mightn't be winning the Olympics but if I can motivate a few little girls down in Skulls Brnev in Cork then I'm going to yeah. do that you know what I mean and then maybe they're going to win the Olympics you know yeah. what I mean but that's that's what it's about to me and when you go to these schools do you get a sense that these are schools that are equipped to kind of prioritise participation? Do you feel that the physical education set up in these schools is where it should be? I'm usually asked by the schools that are all over their sport because that's why they've contacted sure, yeah, that's me. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's always the schools that are really, the teacher is always really enthusiastic mm. and yeah. wants to bring someone in to kind of encourage people, but they're already encouraged because the teacher is the so yeah. enthusiastic. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess it's even back to the point that you made that it's because your PE teacher was so enthusiastic. You know? brilliant, you know. Um, but, and, it, and it is at school, but it's also at home as well. I think yeah. parents are enthusiastic and kids see their yeah, parents going out running. Or I know for myself, my parents were constantly out. And my dad was cycling or my mum was out playing golf. Like our house, we were Your never whole at family, home. yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think it's just, um, it's just what kids see becomes the norm yeah. and then they just get involved. Sure. Yeah. I always say lunchtime in our house on a Sunday was at tea time, it was at six o'clock on a Sunday because there was nobody to be had at lunchtime on a Sunday. <laughs> okay. My dad is 68 and he still cycles 150 miles a week. You know, like, it, it was just, it's yeah. just normal. And when it's, when it's like that and you're growing up, well, you have to do something because sure. otherwise you'll be home on your own. For, for those that don't uh, have a 68-year-old cycling uh, around the country uh, every weekend, like the school then plays a hugely yes. important part in all of this and there is a sense that it's as simple as variety sometimes in these classes certainly like okay I went to an all boys school but it was always like oh, let's just play indoor soccer every week but like I presume that that problem would be more prevalent in a mixed school for sure because there is no variety you don't appeal to everybody's taste I mean you've got Two, two genders instead of one, there's a bro broader spectrum naturally that way. So is it as simple as that or is it actually just the, the education of the teachers perhaps that, that they're not equipped to actually physically educate or is it, as I say, just variety, the variety of sports on offer in, in PE? Well, it's probably a mixture because firstly, the school probably needs a certain amount of funding to have the facilities. Yeah. So maybe you played indoor soccer because there wasn't um, outdoor soccer pitches available. I'm not sure, but you know. There was. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there goes that brain. <laughs> but um, I think, so it does, well, I mean, you need to have a, a pretty good standard of facilities there to start with. But And you also then need the teachers to, to back that up and to, you know, to support it. And I know in the school I went to, and again, I played all um, sorts of uh, school, or sports in school, but... Um, most of it was actually by teachers volunteering after hours, yeah. mm -hmm. like, you know, between badminton, volleyball, uh, you know, camogie. It was all teachers just volunteering that extra hour or two after school. And I think 
that's really important. But it's a big ask of the teachers as well. So, you know, I suppose it's not really fair to just assume that you know, that, that they do that. But maybe it's to incentivise teachers to kind of become more involved and to, to facilitate those those classes and, and, and those parents. As well. I have every intention of coaching. Mm. When my Irish single days are, are gone, I will be down the Leeville track um, and I will be coaching. Um, so, you know, I, when my kids are a little bit bigger because I won't have the time now, but when I'm a bit, a little bit more time rich, I definitely plan on coaching. So it's about giving back, but it's also about normalising it. You know, I have a 13 year old niece. Um, and I've seen, you know, her go into secondary school and she's playing hockey and she's good at hockey and that's brilliant. But some of her friends aren't playing any sports um, and, and that's okay with everybody. And it's about normalising it and how do you make it cool? Mm. Yeah. That's really it for, for the teenagers. Yeah. How do you make it cool and normal to be playing sport? So that's what everybody, it's every part of the teenager's life has to be making sport normal. Their parents, it's not just back down to schools. You can't leave everything, lump everything sure. with the mm. school. Yeah. You know, and even a community, even just going, I mean, if you live near CIT in Cork, you go down and you train with one of the, the athletics clubs um, and like non-running families, they all go because it's just normal because sure everyone's going and everyone in the class is going and then there's this kind of yeah. snowball effect so it just has to be about everybody in a child's life making sure that they're participating yeah like I guess when you, when you take that into account and you mentioned facilities there and kind of different sports that are available to people because they live beside a pitch or they live in the country so there's naturally a lot of fields and stuff it does come back to the sport that we're here to talk about and it is to long distance running and I guess no matter where you are in the world it is the one thing where everybody's on a level playing field so where do you feel Ireland is at in terms of the future of long distance running? Do you feel we're in a good place to keep producing top quality runners? Because we have performed well, like we have performed, I would say we have punched above our weight when you compare ourselves to the other Olympic sports, if you think about it. Um, like is that improving, do you feel? Is, is there a new generation coming through that, that are set, set to take over for me in a couple of years' time and actually represent Ireland in the Olympics and represent us very well? I think there's a huge group of, of young uh, athletes coming through and you'll even have seen that in the last Olympics that some, some, some of the younger guys actually probably performed you know, above what was expected from them. Mm. Um, there's, a, there's a big group of girls coming through as well and um, you know, I think while maybe the marathon isn't something that they've tackled quite yet, um, it's something they will get to because um, you know, I suppose it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a matter of building your base before you get to, that, to the marathon level. But, um, I, as you said, it's so accessible. Anyone can can run. Anyone can, um, especially for long distance. You throw on your runners and you head out the door, and that's it. So, um, I do think that uh, that there will be plenty coming through in the future, and there's lots of stars there. Yeah, for sure. Like, I, I'm not sure. Am I reading this into kind of the Irish psyche too much? But I think there is something kind of suited to the Irish profile about marathon running, about endurance sports, because. We've, got, we've gone on a, on a wild tangent here. We weren't planning on chatting about half the stuff we were chatting about this <laughs> afternoon. But the other thing I, I did want to, to ask you about was um, just about endurance sport. Because in Tyler Hamilton's book, and I know like Tyler Hamilton is a doper and all that sort of stuff. But the reason why he was such a successful cyclist in the first place was because of his love for endurance sport. And he always said, and it was the passage from his book that I always remember, he said that he used to love the feeling of meeting the wall and absolutely crushing the wall. He used to actually really love that moment when he knew he was at the very end of his tether and that it was him versus the other guy and his uh, mental will would always beat the guy beside him. And that's why he got to the position where he was, where Lance Armstrong took him under his wing eventually. Like, do, do you feel that that's a thing that we have in this country, that there's a lot of mentally strong people, but also is that the most important thing? Like, uh, w once you've been identified as a potential contender on a physical level, that it is a game of wits. Well, you're, you're not going to be any good at a marathon if you don't have it mentally in racing capacity. So you could be the most talented on a VO2 max through the roof, mm. but if you can't race, um, you know, you're going to be at nothing. And then the flip side of that is, you know, you can have all the mental will in the world, but you need a bit of talent. So um, I think it's a combination of both. The marathon is incredibly mental. Um, I did 20 miler yesterday and about 18 started to get really tired and I upped the pace. 
Okay. Because I wanted to get home and my head was determined to not let myself fade and whatever. And that's kind of a, a mental thing that you can't kind of teach. It just has to come. I think um, one of the reasons the endurance sports f- suits us here is because we have mild winters. I was only on a treadmill two or three days during the, the big storm this winter. So yes, it rains, but you can go out and run in the rain. So that's important. So we have sure. a nice climate. We're never too hot and we're never really too cold. So that's conducive to it as well. And then you can get these big groups to, to train with. Um, like the mental part of marathon is, I can you know it, you can you can't experience it until you've experienced it. From yeah. twenty two to twenty six in a marathon is unlike anything you'll ever experience, um, and it can be hell, but also it makes the finish line even better. And I think it. I think we're tough. I think Irish people are tough mm. um, because we you know especially when you go out and you train all winter in the cold and the rain, and um, then you get to the start line of Dublin and it's a nice day and you're like oh, bring it come on I've done my training I've done it and we're you know we're hardy I think yeah. personally. Like you mentioned there you can't actually teach that in terms of uh, your mental relationship. You can with, improve with, with it. That's it. That's exactly what I was going to like how, how do you improve it? It's obviously a self-taught thing. Yeah, experience. Experience, probably, yeah. yeah. Now, you can, I mean, I read a lot of books, um, a lot of uh, sports biographies, a lot of them, um, and I take little nuggets from each one I read. There'll always be some, like you had a passage there about Tyler, like there's always, uh, there's a Michael Phelps passage, which I always remember, where he was a small boy and he didn't want to go training and his coach didn't let him and he let him sal- sit on the side and he had to watch the training session and at the end, halfway through, he was like, oh no, I want to get in the pool. He's like, no, no, he's going to beat you in the next gala because you didn't want to train today. And I always remember that. So I always think of the girls in Dublin when I'm in Cork and it's raining <laughs> and I don't want to go out and I'm like, well, if I want to beat the girls in Dublin, I'm going to have to go out today because they're going out. <laughs> you know, so there's little tricks that you use that you can, you can take take nuggets from people but at the end of the day you 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 either want to win or you don't and yeah but maybe that's why you know you do get be- better at marathons with time yes, as well the like experience it is the experience of having gone through it and knowing that you can do it and then knowing that you can build on that and you can actually endure and you can suffer more than you thought you could mm. and i think that's maybe why you continue to progress as you get older as you run more marathons you kind of become wiser and you, you know you can sustain the pain for <laughs> Because it is painful, but it's it's a of nice course. pain. It, it's a it's a it's it is a it's a, like a challenge you set, set yourself. And then, as, as Lizzie said, when you get to the, the finish line, then it makes it all sweeter. Yeah, for sure. Like like Sue, so you mentioned the, the first ever off the bench interview, which was with yourself, Katrina, and I think that kind of uh, definitely triggers that interview. It just kind of talking about your leg that day. And if you want to actually tell the story, because this was, I, I would say, about three years ago now when, when this interview was done, because and a lot of lot of our viewers wouldn't have actually seen this interview. Like, if you wouldn't mind just even, even paraphrasing the story of, of that day in London. Yeah, so um, I guess I was preparing for the, the London Marathon dream come true. Um, I made it to the Olympics. And, uh, you know, because obviously it was going to be the, the biggest race of my life, I was training to the very maximum of my capabilities. And... Uh, as all marathon runners will tell you, um, there is a knife edge when you're training for a marathon and preparing for a marathon. It's very hard not to go over that. Unfortunately, I did, um, you know, in the lead up to London. But in saying that, you know, I suppose the morning of the race, I still felt that I had a you know, pretty good, um, pretty good shot at doing well that day. I knew that I would probably end up coming out of it injured. But, you know, I, I thought that I'd you know, have, a, have a pretty good race, um, you know, when I was there. Um, but unfortunately, things didn't quite turn out that way. And... Um, I ended up um, actually sustaining a, a stress fracture of my fifth metatarsal in my foot um, throughout the race and meant that I, you know, hobbled home in last place, which was pretty upsetting given that it was, you know, effectively um, the worst race of my life on the biggest stage of my life. Um, so I guess, you know, I find that really difficult to deal with and, um, you know, it was extremely traumatic. But um, there, when I look back now, I suppose there are positives that I can take from it. And I suppose one of the one of the main positives really was the crowd that day and how, you know, everyone stayed to, to the very end. Like no matter what athlete they were sporting, they were still there to the very last minute that I crossed the finish line. And um, I suppose it showed the will of people that, you know, that, they w- they were willing me over the line that they really did want want me to get there and uh, um, I guess personally it was it was traumatic and it w- it wasn't the race I'd hoped for but um, I guess maybe it's just a 
an analogy of life as well. Like yeah. sometimes, no matter how well prepared you are, it doesn't really turn out the way you'd hoped, and it's just something you have to try and deal with and, and move on. You know. Can I just say, Katrina actually came in for that interview, and it was meant to be about fifteen twenty minutes, and she talked for an hour, <laughs> and we didn't even interrupt her. She just sat there and talked, and it was an amazing piece because your determination was unbelievable. I don't know how you managed to get through a race with an injury like that, to, like willing yourself forward for such a long time. It was an incredible interview and just an incredible achievement. Thanks. Really was. Well, you we should get that piece back up uh, on the yeah. website. We'll stick it up and off the ball. Check out our social channels in a while. Uh, like that's a completely obviously. You talk about pain, and that's just different layers of pain, isn't it? It's completely. It's not just mental and physical. It's emotional it's at that emotional. point, isn't it? Actually, it was mainly emotional. <laughs> that was the worst, really, mm. because you know we're all used to physical pain and yeah. uh, and um, even the mental pain of running a marathon. But it was the emotional pain of actually not really being able to kind of. Um, process that you know this is the Olympics and this is happening and it's happening right now and you know you, there's in a way it was great because there was so many people there to support but it, it, there was part of me that was kind of wishing everyone would just, <laughs> just go, go away. away. <laughs> <laughs> it's very cool from that as well. Was, um, I felt like I was letting my country down and that was I found that really upsetting because you were doing it so proud and it was in your head you were thinking totally differently. I suppose when you're wearing the Irish vest you always want to be you want it to be the best performance or certainly the best that you're capable of on the day and yeah. I yeah I, I really didn't feel like it was anywhere near that and I, I you know I had knew myself on the lead up to it that I was in excellent shape I was in the shape of my life and then to just not be able to you know, actually produce that mm -hmm. on the day is, is a difficult, you know. Yeah. But um, I suppose that's the, that is the beauty of the marathon as well, that it's, it is a knife edge that you're running and um, it, when, it get, when you get it right, it's just amazing. Um, it's, and you know that it could go so many different ways that when it goes right, it, it does give you an amazing sense of satisfaction. And with the Dublin Marathon, I guess, you know, um, I said earlier on that you know it's a, it's it's known as the friendly marathon and people you know chat throughout the race and that but um, the support is amazing. It really is a fantastic run to do and I think a, a lot of the time that support that you get kind of you know maybe quietens the, the voices in your head and mm. you know gets you there. Yeah, absolutely. So you you went rowing for a while. You're back in the roads now, are you? I am. Yes. Yeah. So what, what's the what's the next step then? Um, I think I'd like to do Dublin Marathon again this year. Okay. As I said, I do love Dublin. Uh, it's a great race and uh, it's organised so well and the support is fantastic. And it's a nice goal to have as well at this time of the year because it's, you know, f far enough out that you can still prepare very well for it. But, um, you know, you do have the time, you know, at the same time. So um, I think uh, that'll probably be next for me. Sure. And then Lizzie, it's Berlin in August? 12th of August, 12 weeks and 6 days. Right. My next marathon. That, that sounds like somebody who's I training and has it. He is trying to kill me. <laughs> they are trying to kill me. Joe Connor and Tony Walsh. Um, yeah, uh, training hard. Just started about two weeks ago. Like, not started training, but really upped the ante about two weeks ago. Um, I'm going to 14 week, really tough block. Um, because I had the baby in June last year, I haven't got the long, long runs done because I had to build back up. Um, so I'm just, I'm only just three weeks ago back at my first 20 miler. So I've got work to do. Uh, it's coming, it's, it's coming, but it's just, it's a slog. Uh, I'm sure that the 12 week road looks like a very long one. So I apologize in advance for bringing this up, but has the word Tokyo been inserted into the discourse at the moment? No, I think, I, I, so I'm gonna say at my age, I'm, I'm 37, I'm gonna be 38 in a few weeks. Um, I'm just taking it one championship at a time. I'm only thinking about the green vest on the 12th of August. Um, that might sound twee or that I'm dodging the question. I'm not. I'm just taking this block um, and I'll get try and get the best out of myself. I want to be on the start line of Berlin in PB shape. Um, and that's all I'm thinking about. And then you, hopefully that I can use that training as a building block for something else. But I'll think about that after the 12th of August, actually probably after the 1st of September. Uh, <laughs> <Just> <laughs> after I've eaten all the pies. <laughs> and yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, that's, that's really what I'm thinking about. I think at, uh, at now, at this stage of my career, I'm just thinking about it championship for championship. Certainly, I, I tried to qualify for London the same day as Katrina actually qualified. We went through, I'd say, about five or six miles together. Um, and then she ran off into the distance and I finished 10 minutes behind her. So I decided that day I was going to try for Rio. So it's been a long, long road to get to Rio. And then there was, so there was a baby in between Rotterdam and Rio and now there's another baby. So 
life is a bit busier and stuff. So, but I still like every time you put on the Irish vest, it's special. Like, it's just something else. So I'll just get the most out of myself in August, and I'll see from there. Well, the very best of luck with the next twelve weeks, uh, Katrina Jennings, Lizzie Lee. Thank you so much for coming in. It was fascinating spending some time in your company. It is the twenty eighth of October, the SSC Electricity Marathon. So get training now if you've done a five or ten k in your lifetime. Now, if you're like me, <laughs> let's uh, let's do twenty nineteen together. Uh, Katrina and Lizzie, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. OTB AM in association with Air. Get Air Sport free with Air Broadband.